Upanha Atukata, higher forms of knowledge, monastic reform, and the practice of insight. So in 1954, as you all know, the Sixth Buddhist Council was about to commence, and it's really a special time in Myanmar history, and you can see that in the newspapers. So if you go to any of the newspapers at that time, for months leading up, you see story after story of the Sixth Council celebrating the Pariyati, or the learning, uh, traditional learning that we see in Myanmar. And so it's a very exciting time. I think a lot of research could be done just on newspapers at that time. But there was one newspaper in particular in May 7th, 1954, so just a few weeks before the start of the council, and it said, hey, although we're celebrating Pariyati right now, don't forget the important uh, innovations and kind of renaissance that's happened in terms of Patipati. So this here is an article from the New Light of, of Burma, and it's uh, Dhammadesana, so it's a, it's a little bit of a kind of a, it appears almost every, every day, a little bit about um, some teaching. But in this article, what it says is that old style, traditional kind of preaching behind the fan slowly is fading away, and we have a new type of preacher emerging, the Vipassana teacher. And they mentioned the Mohin Sayadaw as one of the first and prominent figures in this, but it also talks about the Mula Mingun Zedun Sayadaw. And it actually links this figure as being um, responsible for the birth of Vipassana, I should say the Renaissance, and the proliferation, the spread, and the different schools coming from him. I think it's quite noticeable, I think it's important to note that there's no mention of Lady Sayadaw here. And of course, it's a very important figure in Myanmar history, but in North America, or what I should say, in the Anglosphere, so the English-speaking world, uh, he is often considered to be the, the father of Vipassana, so to speak, and certainly he played a very important role, but the Mula Mingyu Zedu Museada is not as well known in the English language, and so part of my job is to, is to introduce this figure. Now this picture was taken in uh, Ming, Mingun town, in the Mingun Zerun Jam Dike, and what it has underneath it is a little um, caption that was certainly written after his death. So he died in March of 1954, and this caption here um, gives the time of his death, the date of his death, and it also says that he was Yahanta Kitney, so that he was being an Arahant. And so this picture is a visual testament, at least according to his disciples and according to his legacy, of him being an Arhan right in front of our eyes. So I think this is an important picture because we have some of these figures uh, being photographed. So some, I'm not saying this is the earliest photograph, but it's an important early photograph. And uh, it just shows how important of a figure he was considered by some, I should say by many, to be one of the living arhats of the 20th century. And we have many such figures arising, and I think that's an important phenomenon in the late to mid 19th century and the, the 20th century. But he was not just known as a Vipassana uh, monk. He also was known as um, a commentator. And one of the biographies that um, is ascribed to, that his tradition has compiled for him has him as the uh, essentially the eighth in a long line of commentators after uh, Buddhaghosa, and it says that his name was the the person who knew the intention of the Buddha. Now that is quite a claim to make. And I'm not saying that he made that himself, but certainly it's made on his behalf um, by his disciples or in his legacy. So here's a caption. This is actually taken, this picture is actually from the Tatong, uh, from the Mingyun Yingta. And um, it lists two commentaries that he produced. One was the Taitiko Padesa Atakata. That was around 1926. And that was the first new Atakata commentary in more than a thousand years. 
So I'm not saying that there had not been other sub-commentaries, uh, tikas, or different uh, nisayas of the sort, vernacular glossaries. Certainly they have been produced, but this is the first new installment of an atakata of any type in the Theravada world that I know of. So if you do know of another one, please let me know. The Pentaco Padesa was relatively uncontroversial. For those of you who are not too familiar with the text, um, it is uh, considered by Bhikkhu Nyanamoli to be um, a guide for commentators. So originally it was thought to be kind of an Abhidhamma compendium of sorts, but it seems like it's actually a book that helps um, potential commentators decide which passages should I look at and how should I, how should I go about co uh, commenting on those. So, I mean, I think it's really important that this was the first text that he, um, that he wrote the commentary on. And in his biography, it says that there was a moment where he just had a, a lion's roar of courage. And he thought, you know, even Lady Sayada only wrote Tika or Dipanis, and now I'm going to write an Atakata. So that was, I mean, that, was, that took quite a bit of courage. Um, you know, you could say many other things about that. But uh, it certainly was an important moment in Myanmar history, and it shows the way that he viewed himself. Now, just as a little aside, one of the weaknesses of my project is that I haven't actually gone through this text. Um, so here's the Paitago Padesa Atakata, and then there's the Pait on the other side, you see the three volumes, the Paitago Padesa Atakata Nisaya. And so that's, um, that's kind of an auto Nisaya, so he wrote that himself. And I haven't gone through this myself, and I really think in order to understand what he's doing in the Melinda Banha, I should probably have started with this. And so one of the points of this talk today is to show you my weaknesses and also to show you the weaknesses and the strengths of a, of a, of a, a kind of edu a Buddhist education in the Anglo world, in the Anglosphere. So by all means, I'm, I'm vulnerable. Um, I should also say that, that seems like a great topic to me for a PhD thesis. Uh, maybe even too big for a PhD thesis. Uh, and I know that Madhav Deshpande is very interested in this text. Madhav, Madhav Deshpande was the person who, in 1999, actually transliterated, I always get transcribed or transliterated mixed up, transliterated the Melinda Panha Atakata and published it in 1999 at, uh, through uh, the postgraduate uh, International Institute of Buddhist Studies at Tokyo. And also, also a great place if, if people want to do really serious philological work, that's a great place to, to go. So it was published in 1948, the Melinda Panha actually written at about the end of the 1930s, but because he was waiting for the end of World War II and for a situation to settle down, and I think there's other factors there, he didn't actually publish it until 1948. And it was actually at the behest of the Mohin Sayadaw who went to him and requested that he write this text, especially because the Paitiko Padesa um, had an Atakata, he was known for that. The Melinda Panha, which is part of the Kudakan Nikaya, part of the canon only in Myanmar, so not in Thailand, not in uh, Sri Lanka, not in other countries, only in Myanmar. And I believe that was around sometimes at least the fifth council of King Mindong, but officially, but probably sometimes earlier. That I'm not too familiar with. Um, so he, this was published in 1948, and it was kind of hard to get a hold of the copy of this text, and it was smuggled out of Myanmar, apparently, by Indian professor P. V. Bapat. And uh, Professor P. V. Bapat actually gave it to a young Madhav Deshpande as he was going from, I think, Pune to Michigan. And um, Madhav Deshpande transcribed part of it on the boat. And it's really his life, kind of his life's work. Uh, what I should say is it's something he's deeply passionate about, but he admits in this middle copy from 1999 that it's beyond him to be able to actually do the research. He's an Indologist, he's a Sanskritist, he's not a Buddhist study scholar, and now he's a little tool to actually come to Myanmar and to research that. So he said, you know, I have, here's someone please carry the torch, and I was very happy to do so in about uh, 2014 is when I started. On the far side, you see the new copy, which I believe you might have in your library. And that was produced partly by um, Polyseaji uh, Wu Ong Mo, 
and he has been very helpful for this project as well. And um, I think what's interesting is I've also heard now that Vamos Eda is saying, okay, now we can start to publish this text and we can start, it's okay to start talking about it. Now I've heard this secondhand not directly. And so I have seen quite a pro proliferation of people of this, of copies of this text, of people talking about it, especially when I first came to Myanmar five years ago. So it, it now it really seems to be um, the time of the renaissance of this text itself. So I'm going to start my talk here looking at the commentary on the Bhuba Yoga Kanda uh, chapter. And that's pages 7 to 72. I'm working with the Romanized uh, Madhav Deshpande, partly edition, partly because that's easier for me. And that way I can maybe speak with a, a more uh, international audience. Although I use the 1948 text to see if there's mistakes because naturally um, Professor Deshpande introduced a few errors as, as anybody would. So uh, this Puma Yoga Kanda Vaga is a very important chapter. It's the framing story of the past connections between Melinda and Nagasena. And in my view, it actually sets forth the epistemology of this commentary. So how does this commentary go about um, collecting knowledge, um, interpreting knowledge, looking at different viewpoints? We see it in the Puma Yoga Kanda. Now, many of you are probably familiar with this text, and in the Puva Yoga Kanda, you have fleeting moments of what we could call supernatural powers. Some people call it psychic powers. I prefer to call it the higher forms of knowledge, the abhinyas. And so in the actual root text, where the mula is very, very short, it's, you know, a billion monks flew over there to the Himalayas, and, um, and monks and nuns, and uh, there's mind reading, um, there's moments where there's a little bit of Nirodi Samapati as well in there. So these are really quite fleeting moments, and Reese Davis and the other English translators, they don't pay much attention to them. They're not maybe crucial to the text at first sight, but I would argue differently. So in the very beginning of this commentary, now I'm working strictly with the commentary, the Mingun writes that there are numerous ignorant ones who do not wish to discuss the possibility of there being living monks endowed with the knowledge of the path, the knowledge of the fruit, and the knowledge of the duties of the higher forms of knowledge. Those are the Avinyas and the Pali's below in case anyone would like to um, double check what I'm saying. And so what's interesting here is that usually when we look at commentaries of Buddha Gosa, we're not sure what is Buddha Gosa's voice and what is what are the previous layers of commentaries that are coming from India and Sri Lanka. So it's, it's sometimes hard to, to know, is the commentary a compilation, a collection, or is it an original composition? This text is both, but the moments where the voice of the Mingyun Zedun Seyada comes out are very clear, and sometimes they're very bold, if I may say so. Well, this is quite a statement. He's saying there's a lot, there's these, there's these ignorant ones who do not want to even talk about the possibility of obedience today in this very age. He goes on to say that um, indeed this discourse on the higher forms of knowledge, which is about to commence, should not be spoken about as an impossibility. It is not proper to say as much. Why? Now this is actually um, you see this kind of structure a lot in the Kattavatu, where you, you kind of introduce a, a viewpoint and a poising, a, opposing viewpoint, and then you proceed to, to deconstruct or to argue against that viewpoint. So really, the polemical, the argumentative tone is set right from the very beginning of the, of the Puvi Yogi Kanda. So the question is, he answers his own question, so it's a, it's a, you know, an, a polemical rhetoric or an argumentative way of speaking. When the teaching of the Buddha has decayed, those who obtain various sorts of iti are not many, but they still exist, according to the Mula Mingyun Izidu and Seda. Now, what is he talking about exactly? He's talking about the Chala Abhinya, the six uh, traditional Abhinyas, and so I have them listed one to seven here, and I'll just give the English equivalent. Um, the first would be knowledge of various superpowers, so walking through walls, being in one place at the same time, maybe you know, using the uh, sky as a step. They're very closely connected with the casinos. Second, we have the Diva Sota uh, Nyana, and that would be knowledge of the divine ear. 
Third, we have the ability to read the minds of others. Fourth is knowledge of past lives. Fifth is the divine eye, which I would argue is the root of binya. It's really the most important of binya. The anagatangsa, which is the knowledge of the future. And this is really interesting because if you were to open up the Pali Text Society right now, number six would actually be knowledge of the destruction of the cankers. And that would be the super mundane, uh, the, the super mundane abhinya, that's the one that has the more religious kind of value or input. The other ones, you know, other uh, religious aesthetics from different religious groups can access those. But here we have a slightly different list and it, it seems as though actually we have this, um, you don't necessarily have this in the Patisambhita Maga, the Visuddha Maga, but you do see it in different texts. So I haven't quite uh, narrowed down where this is coming from, but the knowledge of the future is very important for the arguments that the Mingyu makes later on. Finally, we have the, the, the seventh, which is knowledge of the, what happens to beings according to their karma. And so that seems to have the place of the super mundane, the kind of religiously important abhinya that a teacher would want to have if they were going to teach other people, especially like a vipassana teacher if they wanted to know what's the best kind of meditation for this person. So um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll just, I, in my first chapter I wrote on the abhinyas, it's about 60 pages long, and, and um, it really is the anchor or the crux, it's the most important part of my entire thesis. But, and there's so, there's so much to talk about in there. But the last thing I'll say is that he, he really wants to say that no, these abhinyas are possible, and that if you don't think they are, it's because you haven't reached the same level as not necessarily as the Mula Mingyu Zedu would say it, it doesn't directly say that, but you haven't reached a high enough level. So the instance in the, the famous um, case in the Melinda Pangha where um, Nagasena thinks, why did, why did Venerable Rohana teach me the Abhidhamma, fir, Abhidhamma first? What a foolish, what a foolish monk. And um, Venerable Rohana, uh, who is actually the teacher of Nagasena because he was in Niroda Samapati cessation meditation where all, when all the other monks were, uh, monks and nuns were at um, in the Himalayas, uh, he, he, he reads the mind and he scolds Nagasena. And so the Mula Mingu Zedu takes this episode and he seems to be scolding others. He says, those who say that the Abhinyas are not true are like the people who are blind from birth. I tell you what blue is and you, you walk away and say, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And so the Abhinyas and their existence, if not in person, then in principle. What I mean is, there are some people that say the Mula Mingu Zedu Seydat had the Abhinyas. There are some people that say no. I'm actually, at least from an academic perspective, saying that's not necessarily important. What's important is that the Mula Mingu Zedu Seydat believes that they are possible in principle. And that there are beings alive today who, if, not, if they haven't accessed them, they can access them through a very kind of routinized, very routine, very everyday process, like remembering your past lives. And so I, I go into that into more detail, but what I as essentially argue about this chapter is that the Abhinyas are an essential part of the, of the Buddha's enlightenment experience. And there is a professor in the, uh, I can't remember, she's from the University of Harvard, she worked under um, Charles Hallisay. And I gave some of the uh, books on PDF to CLA yesterday. Her name is Maria Heim. She's done a series of books on Buddha Gosa that try to look at him in a very different light. And what she argues is that the omniscience of the Buddha is, is the most important part of the commentarial project. Without the omniscience of the Buddha, Pali commentary would not be possible. And the job of the commentator is actually to try to connect the omniscience of the Buddha to the situation that we have today. So I say, okay, if, if the Abhinyas are an important part of the Buddha's omniscience, and if the omniscience are an important part of, of um, the, sorry, let me start that again. I'm, I'm trying to give you a, uh, a logical kind of structure here. If the Abhinyas are an important part of the Buddha's omniscience, and if the omniscience of the Buddha is an integral part of Pali commentary, it follows then 
that the Abenias are an integral part of the common tarot project as a whole. So even though we don't necessarily see the Abenias up front and center in polycommentaries, Western scholars, I believe, don't really understand the commentarial project as a whole because we tend to downplay or degrade the Abhinyas as being superstitious and not a part of proper Buddhism. But here we see a Vipassana meditator, a Vipassana master, who is putting these Abhinyas at the very front of his commentary and saying, no, these are an important part of, of the Buddhist universe. And so this is the epistemology of this commentary, and we'll see the epistemology, the way of knowing, um, played out in, a f in the, rest of the, the rest of the book, actually. Now, this, this is part of why this project is so interesting, because I, I get to do the philological work, the close reading, but there's also a whole political dimension to this. The Uru government, as I'm, you know, I'm sure as all, you all know, started a very, um, uh, a very grand Buddhist revivalist project. And so the, under colonialism, Buddhism uh, was not given the support. There was the non-interference policy by the British. And so Unu set about to revive Buddhism in many ways. That includes the Sixth Council. That includes a whole kind of slew or a whole slate or many different legislation. And of course, the use of Vipassana to kind of train the, the moral hygiene. And I use the word hygiene because there's a little bit of a colonial context there. But it, to train the moral individual in society and therefore try to bring society together. But the problem is, is that this Melinda Panha at the Kata caused Unu quite a bit of trouble. At the same time as he was supporting the Mingun Zedum Seada, and he was supporting the lineage of the Mula Mingun Zedum Seada, especially with Mahasi Seada, who um, is a student of the Mula Mingun Zedum Seada Ji, uh, he was forced to actually confiscate the text. Now here is a picture from the Mingun Jiang Dike in Yangon. I'm not sure if that's the exact uh, name of it. It's near the Singapore Embassy on Damaziri Lan, and it's near Mohan Seada um, uh, quarters as well. And the funny thing is, is that was actually built by Unu in the early 50s. And here's a picture of, on the one side you have the Mula Mingun Zedun Seda, and then the other side you have the insane Mingun Zedun Seada, or later known as the Yangon Mingun Zedun Seada. And he, the newspapers are a very important source for our history of this time. And you think of a newspaper as it compared to an old manuscript, and you know what's interesting about that, but I do think that 1950s, 40s, 30s newspapers are an important source of information. And a lot of these debates and discussions were had in the public sphere the public sphere being a large part made up by newspapers. So here's a newspaper from uh, this is the end of this is the end of December 1949, and what had been going on was there was a whole series of, of, of debates raging about the Melinda Panhat Kata in the newspaper, and the insane Mingun Zeyun Seada he stepped in and he wrote his own article, and that's what I have here. So he says, in the ninth month, on the ninth day of the waning moon, with an order from the Minister Chief of Police, Detective Inspector U um, Bakyan, with about four or five other police in tow, they came to the monastery of the, of the insane Mingun Seada, and they confiscated about 346 books of the Melinda Panatakata. Now I believe the first run, the first print was maybe somewhere about 2,000 and 1,500 copies. So, but this is a pretty substantial amount of copies that they confiscated all at once. And so, this leads me to kind of the second part of this talk. Why, wh why all of this uproar? Apparently there were possible, there was possibly um, uh, unrest in the streets, protest, and I think this might be an you know, apocryphal story, so not, you know, maybe not true, maybe inserted later, but I have heard it said that it was um, ceremoniously burnt on the altar of the Shwedigam Pagoda, this Melinda Panhatakata. So sometimes, I, you know, I wonder, well, is this a good text for me to study? But um, I think it can help us, help us learn a lot. 
So what's with all the controversy? Well, the controversy actually starts somewhere in the middle of the text, and this is not exactly the scale, but I, I tried my best to show you, in the uh, Mendaka Panha Kanda. So for about 100 pages, everything's fine, you know, it's generally commentary, I mean, it's not too controversial, and then at this point here um, is where the controversial passage be passages begin. And what's really interesting is uh, the way that the Mula Mingun Zedubu Niseyada uses the questions of the Melinda Panha as, uh, as a catalyst or as like a launching pad or as a way to begin and introduce some of his more controversial ideas. And so the Melinda Panha Atakata, in a way it's like, it's an unstable text, you could say. It's a volatile text. You have all these contradictions and these contradictions need to be resolved. But sometimes those very contradictions, those two-pronged questions, um, they're, they're vulnerable to many interpretations. And so it's, it's a kind of a, un, a volatile text in that way. So I want to go into what, were, what was all the problem with this text. Now here, again, I'm, I'm kind of documenting this through the newspapers. I found maybe six or seven newspapers. I should say Yumi also found many and Ma Pyo also found many. We did it together as a team, but I'm very grateful. So here's a newspaper from November of 1949, so before the Insane Mingun Zeru Seada wrote his reply. And what it says is, um, it's, a, it's a group of um, Dhamma teachers, and they're getting together, and they're trying to discuss, is this, is this Melinda Pan Atakata inside or outside of the sasana, of the tatana? And they say, in the aforementioned document, the Melinda Pan Atakata, because of making mistakes in the problems of writing Pali according to the grammatical rules that should not be done wrongly, such as in the accusative case, the nominative case, the singular number, plural, etc., uh, this text should not be considered part of the sasana. So it's similar to a case, I believe, with the Mogok Seyada um, under the monastic courts, where he was found to have maybe written some uh, place names wrong, or maybe got the names of trees wrong. And so the idea is, how can an enlightened being, or a purportedly enlightened being, make mistakes in Pali? And there are many mistakes to be seen, and it's a little bit beyond my Pali skills, to be honest with you, because I've been working on this text for four or five years, so I'm, that's the kind of Pali I know. <laughs> you know, the Mula, Mingu, Zeru, Pali, that's what I've kind of been trained on. But um, I'll just show you a few examples. So this comes from a section on the Katine, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And it, you see the word in red there? Udariyati. Now the problem with that is that it's supposed to be, it's, it's a passive verb he, given here and given twice, so it doesn't seem like it's a mistake. But in every instance that I've seen in the dictionaries and in the Kamagwacha, in the ceremonial um, uh, kind of legal texts, uh, it's always given as uh, not, not as a passive, as an active verb. And so the question is, why all of a sudden is he introducing passive verbs? And I know sometimes that happens, but it shows one example of the kind of maybe more flexible poly. Some people call it bad, bad poly. Is it as bad poly? Is it simple? I think there's more to it, to that. And I guess I also have faith in the Mula Mingun Zedirun Seda to kind of think maybe there's something more going on. But that's just one instance. And really, in order to document and understand, what I've been doing is as I translate, I just have a file open. Every time I see something that's odd, I put it in there, I put a note. And then at the end of my thesis, I can look at all of those and see if there's a pattern. One thing especially is that he seems to really default to the feminine gender, whereas the, the word should be, a, he really kind of seems to have not really, he doesn't care too much about the genders, say Adaji, but it seems to default to the gender, the feminine gender, and sometimes the numbers are very loose as well. Another example, um, now this is a little bit of a game here, can anyone see what's wrong with this? This and of course I've had lots of help with these. This is not just my myself working this. What what's wrong with this text here? Any guesses? And, and this is and what's funny is this this comes not too long after um, uh, the different expertise of King Melinda is described. So of course he talks a little about the Vedas, the Vedas, right? And so I was looking at this and we're like, okay, in the Vedas, quotation marks. 
and it was very confusing for a long time. But actually, and I checked the different copies, and this is in the original, it's actually the V, E, D, E, the T, I should not be separated. It should be V, D, D, as in it, it's in G knows. But here it's separated as V, E, D, E, T. And so this seems like good evidence of a dictation error, meaning that the Mula Mingun Zeta Mula Zeta was speaking the text, and someone was writing it down and listening to it, and didn't actually hear that properly and just separated the T. So the poly itself, I think, is less of a strict textual poly, and it seems like more of a oral poly, and maybe more of a spoken poly. And if that's the case, I think that's a really exciting because uh, I'm sure there are these communities of poly speakers in Myanmar, especially in these meditation yiktas, where, but usually these, this spoken poly does not show up in written text. So here we might have an example of written poly. That's, that's, you know, I was very excited when I found that. Problem. Manuscripts. It seems, now I'm not a cryptologist, so I don't know exactly how to look at people's handwriting and see if that's the same, and you know, tell about the personality. But this here seems to be a manuscript of the, Mingun, of the Mula Mingun Sayadaji. And so if he wrote it himself, but he, there seems to be dictation errors, it's very confusing. A colleague of mine mentioned that it could be what they call like a sub-vocal mistake. And I'm sure you've experienced this before where you're writing something down and you're listening to radio or you're listening to someone's talking to you and then you write down what that person said instead of what you were thinking in your mind. And so I think the human mind is quite complex, especially memory. It's possible, possible that he put those, um, he put those uh, mistakes in himself as he was kind of speaking the poly and writing it down at the same time. What's interesting about this is that um, he, it's kind of like a stream of consciousness. So there's, a, there's, I believe it's James Joyce, Ulysses, but there's a few texts in English where the writer didn't have proper structure. It's just almost like your thoughts. You wrote down your thoughts. You say, oh, today I'm giving a talk about Mula Mingun Zedun and I really like ice cream, and then, hey, what's that over there? No, it seems like maybe this is the kind of poly that we see here, like a very fluid, very just off the, the tip of the Sayadaji's head. The other thing to think about would be the concept of the lecture notes. And actually, uh, this was suggested to me by Professor Mahesh Gayokar, who came to Toronto recently, and he said, because he's very interested in uh, Ashin Janaka Mimamsa, and actually they're very interested in Burmese uh, and Myanmar uh, monks over in, in, in Pune there. And so he said, well, the reason why Janaka Mimamsa was so Pro prolific and why he wrote so much was because he would just had his lecture notes, prepared them, and then he just published them. And so I know that the Mula Mingun Zayrun Seyra was speaking Pali, specifically with lay women, um, maybe even the daughter of the Mohin, uh, sorry, the, sorry, the sister of Mohin Seyra, I could be wrong on that. And so it's very possible that these were lecture notes. One day he wrote them down quickly, and then next day he presented them. And another um, idea that supports that is some of the commentary is so basic, it breaks down the poly words in such a elementary or rudimentary manner that it seems like he's actually teaching poly at the same time as teaching this text. So these, I, I might never know the answer to this, but I think it's important to actually push back against, this is the idea of a book, you sit down, you very nicely write that book, and then you go away. I think there's, it's a much more active, fluid, participatory uh, action that we see here. So again, I might not be able to answer it completely, but one thing that I do need to do is go into the marginalia. And so this is the stuff that we see in the margins here. And uh, this is not the best picture, but the insane mingun zeta mun seyada, and then a seyaji, uh, seyatan, a poly seyaji, Say a ton, I, I, I'm not familiar with him, were actually went through this manuscript and you see all you see all sorts of markings and red ink and blue ink and so I would have to do a systematic study and look for patterns and if I find a problem in the root text, go to this manuscript and see if did anyone notice that? Did they suggest to the Mula Mingu Zeru change this? And maybe he didn't change it. And so these are some of the ways that I'm trying to look at this commentary not just as a derivative, 
not just as uh, connected to the root or subservient to the root, but as its own important text on its on it in its in its own right, and how I'm trying to look outside of the text and kind of push the study of philology in different directions. So that's the one problem. The poly is not great, or the poly is different than what we think is conventional kind of conservative poly, scholastic poly. Now the second problem has to do with the with two issues. One is um, the fact that the Mula Mingun Zedun Seada promoted in this text the full ordination of women, the Bikuni Sasana. Now, I say that's, that's the second issue that caused people concern. And so here's a different newspaper that we see. This one's from November 24th, 1949. And this is, again, another group of learned scholars getting together and saying, mm, we're not sure what he's doing here with this Melinda Panna at the Kata. So I, I haven't actually gone too carefully over this issue yet. This will be my fourth or fifth chapter. Um, it's very important. but. He couches this idea. So the issue of the Bikuni's uh, ordination comes up in the Melinda Panha, the root text, when the king Melinda asks Nagasena about the longevity of the sasana. How long will the sasana last? Some people have said this, some people have said this. What do you think? And so he uses this as a, as a kind of a platform or as an opportunity to launch into his discussion about 15, 20 pages as to why women should be reordained. And he, he couches it in this phrase here, the anagata bikunam. And that's the doctrine handed, not uh, nayodino. This is the, uh, the doctrine handed down to future monks. So this is where, again, the abhinyas come into play. Because the idea is that the, the historical Buddha, the Buddha could see the future, knew that the female, that the bhikkhuni sasana would disappear, and so implemented or embedded or put inside of the Vinaya regulations, especially um, um, second, primary and secondary regulations that can be made use of in the future in order to bring about the, the bhikkhuni sasana. And so he, he discusses it all in terms of this, what are the doctrines handed down to future monks? And how am I, as a commentator, going to unravel or going to make sense of these doctrines for you, the modern, contemporary audience? So I'm not gonna go too, I'm not gonna go um, too much into, I'm not gonna go too much into the actual arguments because they are essentially the same arguments that you see being used and invoked by people like Bhikkhu and Nalio. But what's interesting here is that we have the first historical instance where these arguments are, 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 are uh, being presented. What I should say is the second historical incidence. So the arguments, just quickly, it's the idea that um, with uh, Mah Maha Prajapti, Project, where you can, um, you can uh, monks can ordain women, or that uh, women from other bhikkhunis from neighboring countries can ordain, come here and ordain uh, others. So those are the two basic arguments. I need to go th much more carefully through the poly on this. Um, but what's important to note is this is the second instance where you see this, because a Shin Aditsa Vamsa, or a Shin Adesa Wanta, actually wrote his Bhikkhuni Upadesa, Bhikkhuni Tatana Upadesa, in 1934, it might be 1936, but I think it's 1934. And um, again, I haven't gone through that text too carefully. I just received a copy of it from the Yangon Dekato, the University of Yangon Libraries, a week ago. And but what's important to note is that U Myat Ja, who is uh, a lay meditation teacher, also very important for spreading the Mingu method in in, in Shan State here. He was, he actually typed up the manuscript of the Bikuni Tatana Padesa. And there's a story in the Bikuni Tatana Padesa where Ashinadesa Wanta and other, um, other um, Ashinpeya were, were gathered and they were talking about this issue very casually, nothing too serious. And Umiya Ja was listening to everything, writing it down, and then published it in the newspaper forcing Ashinadesa Wanta to publicly address this. 
And so in the Bikuni uh, Tatana Padesa in 1934, the, um, the uh, Ashina Desa Wanta actually says that, well, look at what the Mula Mingunze de Munseada is doing over here, especially with his Petago Padesa Atakata, because the Melinda Panha Atakata was not published yet. And so he doesn't, I still have to go through this, and I'm not sure, maybe there's another argument for Bikuni Sasana ordination in the, in the Petiko Padesa at the Kata, I'm not sure, but there's this connection, and at least one degree of separation between the Shinna de Sawanta and the, and the Mula Mingun Zeru Seida, especially connected by Umya Ja. And it seems like they knew about one, one each other, and the Shinna de Sawanta especially knew that the um, Mula Mingun Zeru Seida was favorable towards Bikuni ordination. Ashin Adesa Wanta, also, um, I think his writing and his, 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 the figure is another great topic for a PhD dissertation. And um, there's Ashin Janaka, the student of Kate Crosby, has written a wonderful thesis that kind of presents him or introduces him very um, a small bit, but a lot more work needs to be done, especially collaboration with India, because he spent a lot of time in India was debating in Sanskrit, there must be writing there that we just don't have access to because of my language skills or, or maybe yours. But collaborative research, I think, needs to be done there. So um, the, now, I won't read this out all, but what it says is that now we will finally see the face of the Blessed One, like the full moon. We're back to the Melinda Panna at the Gata, and what he's saying is, now I, I, I'm the one who represents the proper view of the moon. And this commentary is, the interpretation I've given you is what the Buddha actually intended. So again, he's known as the commentator who knew the intention of the Buddha, at least within his lineage. Again, and again, it's what is called the doctrine for future monks handed down. So that's the Bikuni issue. The next, oh, now why is this important? I think this is really important in the Mula Mingun Zeru Seda's larger vision for Vipassana. And that's why I have the practice of insight in this. Because here, here is a thesis from an American man written in 1957. And I, I think he might be talking about Mahasi, I'm not exactly sure. But he has an instance here where two young men were very hastily ordained because they were laid. It was thought that they actually had reached enlightenment while they're meditating in a lay center. And so what happens to somebody who is not ordained and reaches enlightenment? Either they become uh, monastic and they ordain, or within 24 hours or so, they, they die. And I'm not, again, sure where this exact source comes from, whether this is the suttas, whether this is the commentary, but this poses a problem. If you're the Mula Mingu Zeru Seada and you're teaching, you're teaching lay women, you need a source, you need an avenue for them to become ordained if they reach spiritual states. And this was actually, um, this is a, this is, this is, I haven't found this in writing, but I've um, been told that this is, this was the belief of the Mula Mingun Zeru Seada. Out of compassion, this is why he argued for the Bikuni Tatana. Um, and this is, this is, um, this is what his, this is one of the anecdotes or the stories in his legacy. So I think, yes, looking at the textual argument is very important, but I think we have to take a step back and look at the soteriological argument. How, what this means for people who are coming on the path, especially practicing Vipassana as lay people. Now the next issue, and I, I, I know I'm running a little bit out of time, but I'm very excited to be talking about this. The next issue has to do with the Katina Kama, the Katain ceremony. And so what the Mula Mingu says is that, he says, how, when it is said, we give this cloth for the for the katina to the sangha is the katina cloth given at an inauspicious time, the akala chivaram. So even if it's it's the middle of the katina months and you do everything properly and you give the katina at the right time and it's accepted at the right time, if you say we give this cloth for the katina to the sangha, you've done it wrong, according to the mula mingu zeru and And so the poly there is. Um, Imam Katina Sivarang Sangasa Dema. And the problem that he has is two words, Imam and Sangasa. And he doesn't like Imam in the, um, that's the nominative there, or this Katina, I should say. And then the Sangasa, the datum. 
And so he says, you should those words you shouldn't say. You should just say, we give this, we give this, uh, we give for the katina. He gives you various different things that you can say, but you cannot say, we give this material for katina to the sangha, we give it to the both sanghas, we give it to the sangha which was completed, the rains, so on and so forth. These are not found in the suttas, they're not found in the Vinaya or in the commentary, and so it is not proper to say, even if you do everything right and you utter these words, you're doing it wrong. Now, I'm not exactly sure why he, why he says this. I think it has to do with the concept of uh, nimita and animita. And so when you, when you say, this cloth I'm giving, you're, you're putting a mark, you're marking that cloth, and the, marks, the cloth should not have any marking on them both kind of figuratively and physically. And I think the other idea has to do with the, the sangasa, the idea of the intention. And it's not so much, at least according to what I understand from the Katina Vinitsaya uh, that we see produced by the Mula Mingun and Zedun Sayada, it seems as though it's not that you're giving the cloth to the sangas exactly, but to the sasana, and that both lay women and men and monastics are participating in this, in the Katina Kama. Even though the Kama happens in the Sima, and even though only the monastics wear the robe, um, it's important that it's for the benefit of the Sasana in general. And what he does is he, he says, okay, these are very minor offenses. Um, not, you know, not taking your robe out and un unfolding it and letting it air out, but they're, they're actually grave and they're very serious for the whole sasana in general. So he was very strict with his vinaya and his, in his yinkta and atong, he's known that uh, monks had to actually, um, any, if they wanted to come meditate, they had to uh, memorize both patimokas and um, they very strict with the Vinaya, which as a Western scholar, I thought, well, you're, you're a Vipassana monk, why would you care about the Vinaya? But of course, it's a part of the aesthetic, the, the kind of, uh, the, the practice, the aesthetic practice of, of monasticism, and so it's an essential component of the Vipassana. So I, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is I don't really know what's going on here. This is uh, difficult for me, but I, I'll need to spend more time. Um, the Katina, I used to think Vinaya was, was boring, I'm sorry to say that. But now I realize it's because of my own ignorance. And I mean, it's, it's opened up a whole new world for me to try to learn about. So we go back to the insane Mingun Zeyun Zeyada and finishing off with his kind of reply to the newspapers. And what he says, he says, if, so he calls, he says, we need to get all of the Zeyadas, the leading Zeyadas of this country together, and they need to decide whether this is a good book, whether it's inside the sasana, or whether it's not. And if it's wrong, we'll accept it. Now, I think there's a little bit of kind of confidence there, knowing uh, we don't actually think it's wrong, but if they do think it's wrong, we'll accept it, and we're ready for the punishment by the administration. And if they decide that the book is right, he wishes that the administration of Udnu apologizes for confiscating the book and actually brings it back. And so there was a little bit of controversy because eventually Udnu administration said, oh yeah, okay, we're, we were wrong, you can come get the book. And the Insu Mingu Seyada says, no, 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 you bring it back to us. You came and you took it from the monastery, you come, you bring it back to us. Now, Part of it is that the Melinda Ponha at this time was actually being written in stone slabs, which are currently housed in Yangon. If anybody wanted to go see them, I'll show you a picture of them. But what's important here is the idea of getting a, a group of monastics together and deciding whether this is right or wrong. This is actually a, kind of a nightmare situation for Unu. Unu does not want to step in and be the arbitrator. He does not want to decide whether it's right or wrong. He wants a group of monastics to decide, and he'll just follow through with what they decide um, as a neutral party. In 1949, we have the um, uh, Monastic Courts Act, or the uh, Tana Vinichaya Act. And um, the late Andrew Huxley, he's a scholar of uh, legal um, law and Buddhism in Britain, he believed that the Unu government actually hurried the passage of this law to deal with the Melinda Pana Atakata because it was causing such a major rift. 
He was also supporting, he was supporting the Mingyun lineage at the same time as confiscating the books. So a very difficult political situation. And so the idea of the acts is we're gonna let the Sangha decide this internally. So there's there's a very interesting um, uh, uh, kind of dynamic with the legislation at this time, and also the Sixth Council. If you allow anybody, I shouldn't say anybody, but I mean if, if someone can write a modern commentary the last of which was written more than a thousand years ago, then you're starting to lose a little bit of control over the canon, the poly canon. And I, I believe that Udu um, had the Sixth Council for, you know, for very pious reasons and for very noble reasons, I, I do believe so. But I think there was also a certain political uh, reason for that. And what I mean is, if you want to control the bodies of monastics, you can't actually use violence and send the police and, oh, I've arrested you. If you want to control the bodies of monastics, you control the texts. And so the, the one or two shoulder uh, debate, I think, is a very good example of that. And the reason I came with, uh, with this idea is because of a Shin Janaka's thesis about Shin Okata and how the monastic court systems were brought in, especially after Udu, to try to deal with some of these issues. And so you need a stable set of texts if you want to use those texts to adjudicate and judge court cases. And so the Sixth Council, whether by design or just by accident, produced that stable set of texts. And it can be used then to control the bodies of monastics in the future, or control their ideas, uh, and so, so on. And so we actually see, in, with the Melinda Panha Atakata, a different story. We see a text that um, maybe has spoken poly, or very you know, fluid, kind of non-normative, non-correct, or schol scholastic poly. We see him uh, using vipassana and meditation to try to understand the Melinda Panha. And Abhidhamma as well, which is one of my weak points, I will and must admit. And he is kind of representing an alternative type of authority. And this alternative type of authority, I think, gives us a different story, maybe a counter story or like an opposite narrative to what we have with the official Sixth Council. Needless to say, the Sixth Council did not accept any of the writings of the Mula Mingun Zedun Seada, and so they are at a very uh, precarious position, both kind of inside and outside of the Sasana, depending on, on who you ask. And lastly, I'll just show you these pictures here because I think the Melinda Panha is a perfect example of some of the counter stories or the counter narratives that we have at that time. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you very much.